Happy Monday everyone, I'm Martha with Nature Niche and for this week's environmental topic I wanted to talk to you about invasive common reef also known as Phragmites. So there are actually two subspecies for this really tall grass. Um, the invasive one is Phragmites australis subspecies australis and the native one is subspecies americanus. And that one you would find um, in very sparse clumps in uh, natural marshes and fens um, and along lake shores. The invasive one um, started in southeastern Michigan. Um, it's less common as you go north, um, still pretty uncommon in the upper peninsula, but you'll see it. This is the iconic species the dense um, colonies of straw colored stems with the big poofy uh, seed heads along the highways as you're driving. So you'll see huge stands of this along our highways. Um, it's a very aggressive invader of our roadsides, our ditches, um, and native wetlands and lake shores as well. So it forms those dense stands that I mentioned and it gets really high. It can get up to 20 feet high. So this is not something you want to try to bushwhack through. It's very easy to get in the middle of a stand, get dis, um, disoriented, not really know what direction is, is what. So um, not fun to walk through. And uh, I wanna point out some features so that you can recognize this species and hopefully I can show you a native one um, in future weeks but the invasive one in general, big tall grass, very wide leaves, and uh, especially earlier in the growing season, it tends to be a blue-green color, and they're wide, and they take an awfully long time to taper to a very sharp tip. So those tapering leaves, um, the big fluffy, seed heads, the fact that it's in a very dense stand are all clues. Um, when it's young, you might confuse it with reed canary grass. So the trick with that is to check um, where the leaf base meets the stem. And we're looking for a tiny fringe of hairs or ligule um, that's a fringe of hairs at the base of the leaf. So. Um, check that out, read canary grass, that'll be a clear membrane. And then I also wanted to point out the um, persistent stems with the, the persistent leaf uh, sheaths. So the, where the leaf comes and wraps around the stem, that stays on the invasive plant um, and gives it uh, sort of a ridged kind of corduroy texture and is tan in color. And on our um, native species, this would be a smooth kind of bright red purple stem with the leaf sheaths uh, being deciduous or falling off. So um, those are some quick characteristics to make sure you have the invasive Phragmites. And uh, it was first collected in Michigan in uh, 1979 and uh, it's um, from Eurasia. A lot of the invasive uh, strains that people have been studying generally originated um, out of Eurasia. And uh, it forms very aggressive rhizomes, so underground roots that can go meters deep, and also very long above ground stems that grow flat on top of the ground those can extend um, 13, up to 13 meters, so it really does spread very um, aggressively in, in its vegetative form. I've even seen it, uh, this is a stand in my, um, uh, where I live, in my neighborhood in a roadside ditch. We've actually seen it try to come up and poke up through the asphalt. So it can be a very uh, problematic species and uh, so what does it do to the ecosystem? So an invasive species by definition causes harm um, to ecosystems. 
Um, so it can grow so rapidly in shallow water that it can consume um, vernal pools and ponds within a couple of years. It can clog waterways like ditches um, and the tall stems uh, shade out our native aquatic and marsh plants. Like here we have common um, bone set trying to grow. There's uh, native calico aster, some really neat things in this roadside ditch um, that are getting outcompeted by this invasive species. It forms a lot of dead debris. All these stalks um, will form a lot of debris and that can actually be a fire hazard as well. And uh, it eliminates the habitat for a lot of our native wildlife, like our wetland, um, marsh, bird species, um, insects that would feed on those native wetland plants, that sort of thing. So it really displaces our native flora and fauna. So we should be concerned about this species. Um, it spreads in water uh, by root fragments or stem fragments. It gets moved around when we do construction or we regrade um, a ditch and there are plant parts uh, caught in the machinery or we move soil and there are root or stem fragments in that soil. Um, it can spread by seed, but a lot of times the seed isn't viable in this particular species and is very difficult to treat. So if you have this plant on your property um, along your roadside, um, late summer now is a great time to try to treat it. You can do repeated cuttings on very small, sparse um, colonies of it and uh, then drip uh, very carefully a little bit of aquatic formulated glyphosate, which um, an example, a trade name of that uh, would be Rodeo. I think Roundup um, is like a trade name and then Rodeo would be the aquatic uh, formulation. So you wanna make sure, uh, especially if you have this plant over standing water, that you're using um, aquatic labeled herbicides for treatment and that you get an aquatic nuisance control permit from um, Eagle. So it is to, to spray herbicide over standing water, you need that particular permit from the state. And uh, you can also, there's something called a bloody glove technique where you wear um, uh, a rubber glove and then put a cotton glove over it and um, soak that glove in herbicide and then run your hand up the leafy stem. That's a way to foliar apply um, herbicide. And uh, for large stands, we have to do things like burning to get rid of the extra thatch. Um, flooding, if you have a wetland where you can control water level, but that water has to be at least three meters deep. Um, for a certain amount of time to be effective at helping to control this plant. Um, and then also aerial, like out of airplanes, they, they spray this invasive species along our coastal wetlands by airplane um, or foliar herbicide treatment, like with a backpack or pump sprayer and a, and a wand. So um, those, are, those are control options. And if you wanna read more about that, I just wanted to point out a couple of um, good places where you could do more reading. Um, this is out of State of Michigan, a guide to the control and management of invasive Phragmites. And uh, Ontario, Canada also has what looked like a very helpful um, invasive Phragmites best management practices. So uh, take a look at these two guides or contact a professional um, herbicide applicator if you're unsure but no, you know, you need, you need help to get this species under control. So uh, help me uh, preserve our native wetland habitats and our native flora and fauna by um, documenting and controlling this invasive species. Thanks.